All right, welcome everybody. You are in for a real, real great treat. Um, we have on the call today in our first ever cozy copywriter chat, because I love uh, alliteration. Um, this is a guy that I think, you know, by his own admission has been sort of behind the scenes, um, but he's been there for a long time, writing killer converting copy, selling all kinds of stuff. We're going to find out more. He has an incredible story, which I've read part of, and I almost couldn't stop. He almost got me to spend my whole day just trying to read his stuff. Um, Gary, um, I, I should have asked your pronunciation, Walter, Walter Sheed. Shied. Shied. So close. That's it. Walter <laughs> Shied. Um, okay. So Gary, you know, I'm really pumped. And I'm, you know, first want to say thank you for joining me. And for those of you watching live or uh, the replay, this is sort of the, uh, you know, this is our first time and I like the live approach. So Gary and I, we chatted some, but we didn't, we, we aren't like scripting this and doing all that stuff. So Gary, I want to start with you, of course, obviously, and, and just kind of, you know, tell us your story a little bit, your background, how you got into being a copy writer, and then we'll go and, and we'll try to teach people some cool stuff. Sure. Absolutely. My pleasure. And thank you, Michael. Hello, everybody. My name is Gary Walter Scheid, and I am a veteran of 37 years as a copywriter. I got my start in my 20s. I'm probably older than I look, but let's hope. And uh, the way I got into it was a good friend of mine who was my age. His dad was in the direct mail business, and he noticed that I had a talent for writing, which I was telling Mike earlier that it was something I was born with. Even in elementary school, my third grade, fifth grade, seventh grade teachers were all telling me, you need to be a writer someday. And in high school, I was singled out by teachers. They would <laughs> raise up my term paper and go, this is the best damn term paper I've ever read in my life. So I knew that I had this talent. But then after my college year, I was like, OK, how do you make a living as a writer? And I didn't know anything about direct mail and copywriting. Uh, at first, I was thinking of being a screenwriter. So I took some courses at USC and UCLA Extension from some top screenwriters. And I've learned a lot about screenwriting. And so then this, my buddy's dad, he asked me one day, he goes, hey, what do you plan to do? And I said, well, I'm thinking of becoming a screenwriter. He says, don't do that. You'll starve. So he goes, become a direct mail advertising copywriter. I'll teach you how. Because this guy was the hub of a lot of the direct mail and direct marketing activity because he was a list broker in Southern California. He was personal friends with Jay Abraham and did a lot of business with Jay and Gary Halbert. And he represented some of the top copywriters of our day, the names that you may know, guys like Gary Bensavanga and Clayton Makepeace, Jim Rutz, Paris Lampropoulos came on board there. He was just a startup copywriter when I was a startup copywriter. And John Carlton was in our group. So all these greats were, I just happened to fall into this. And John Finn was the name of this guy. And he said, here, read this book. And he gave me a book on how to write fundraising letters. And I was a political activist in my youth and a little bit now. And he said, you can actually learn how to write fundraising letters that help the organizations that you work for and the causes that you believe in. So I said, OK, let me give this a try. And it was a wonderful book. You can still get it. It's by a guy named Jerry Hunsinger. And only people in the fundraising, nonprofit fundraising world would know who Jerry Hunsinger is. And it's just a, a book is very simple. It's titled Fundraising Letters. And it was it came in a three ring binder, you know, punch hole kind of paper, mm. eight and a half by 11. So I devoured this book. I took to it like a fish to water. I've always had sort of a entrepreneurial spirit and sales and you know I wanted to be the type I personality what they call influencers before we use that term now yeah and I read this book and I was working for an organization that had a summer camp program for kids and they had a little fundraiser that they would do by direct mail and I said hey let me write a fundraising letter based on what I've learned in this book and we'll do a split run test and they were open to that and we did a split run test and mine got like five times the response of their typical letter that they would usually send out. So I had tasted blood. And when I left that organization, John Finn 
got me a job just as an office boy for a direct mail advertising agency that's still around by a guy named Craig Huey. And he's one of the greats in our industry, but he hired me and I was the assistant to the copy chief there. So before I was writing copy, I was making copies. I always tell people that is that it's okay to start at the bottom and work your way up. In fact, that's probably the best way. So I worked there for a couple of years and then Jay Abraham needed a new assistant. His old assistant retired and John Finn said, hey, you want to work for Jay? I'm like, are you kidding me? Of course. So Jay and I had already worked on one project earlier. And so he knew who I was and he knew I could write. So he hired me in an instant. And that was the best education I ever got, I was working for Jay Abraham as his right hand man for three years. And then Jay and I parted ways and Gary Halbert snapped me up because Gary was looking for an assistant. And he also hired John Carlton at the time. So John Carlton and I ran Gary Halbert's office in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard. And now Bond and Kevin are running the business. They were just teenagers at the time, <laughs> walking in, you know, <laughs> he, would, he would be usually pissed off at them or something. But I remember them, they'll remember me, but we haven't seen each other in many years. So then I went freelance back in 91 and John Finn was my agent. And all these people who knew that I had worked for Gary Halbert and Jay Abraham, they all knew that I was writing the copy that they were paying a big bucks for. So I had an instant clientele. I did not ever have to worry about how do I get clients and so forth. That scenario obviously cannot be replicated, but that's how I got into it. And so I've talked to a lot of copywriters. They all say the same thing. I just kind of fell into it, you know, or stumbled onto it because back then, and even these days, you know, back then you, there were no big copywriting courses. There was no copywriting training industry like there is now. All that came along with the advent of the internet, because now with the internet, everybody needed more copy. And so that's why you have groups like AWAI, um, who I greatly respect. And they were training new copywriters. And it's not easy to learn all of this stuff. I'm still learning it to, the, to this day. You know, I've been doing it for 37 years. And I read all this stuff. I follow. That's how I met up with Michael. And I met up with people on Facebook all the time. And it's really cool to be able to get the information now that wasn't available even when I was first learning. I had to read, there were maybe like five good books. Now there's like 55 good books. So that's a, my background in a nutshell and we can take it from there, Mike. Yeah, what's crazy is just from that little bit that you've said, you could probably do hour long talks about your time <laughs> with Jay. Well, the, the funny stories were how I got fired by Gary and Jay. To, and they, they take a while, but they are funny yeah. in hindsight. They weren't so funny at the time. At the time yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying you probably got so many stories. So I many. do. Wait, I call myself the man with a million amazing stories. Yeah. And it, that's an exaggeration. It's actually 998,000. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's really, that's really awesome, man. I think Thank that's, you. Like I appreciate a, that. What a great background and, and a great, just a great starting point. So, yeah. So I, th I think for a lot of our people, you know, they're, either looking for cl uh, clients or they're learning their skills too. they're still developing their skills they maybe done a few things they've you know they were written a few things given given your experience what do you recommend people focus on you know, maybe, you know first if they're trying to grow to grow their customers or, or you know because i know you're like me we I, I also i began in 2006 in a direct mailhouse so and they were selling like personal development type type things and and i had to learn to write like postcards and the eight pager the you know the two the it's it's four pages right front and back and the folding and all that mess and um you know so i, I guess people that, that are coming up these days they don't have that right they're not doing a direct mail pieces so what do you like to have people focus on first or what's a good spot for them to go for, you know? No, that's, that's a good question. And I'm glad you put it in that framework perspective because when the internet came along, it changed everything. Some for good, some for bad. I know that since I'm a little bit older than probably everybody in the audience combined, <laughs> no, no, I'll be 59 this year. Yeah. So 
I'm not a techie and I've old guys like us <laughs> hate that word, but they tell us that we're kind of uh, miffed that technology has passed us by. So now you, you like my dad was born in 1925. So even when personal computers came along, his generation was like, what the heck are these? So now I know what he feels like. And I even starting to look like my dad. He's got this big old pot belly. <laughs> but the, what you want to do is adapt yourself to the market. And right now it's changing so much that you really have to stay on your toes. The good part about direct mail when it was king, as well as print advertising, like in newspapers or magazines, it was so simple. I mean, I could set type. I've Jay Abraham got me an Apple computer and I set the actual type on the ads because you, it was so simple. All you had to do is turn in camera ready copy or a floppy disk and away it went. Now you've got all this stuff with HTML and you know, I, yeah, I can't even perfect. begin to describe yeah. all the stuff because it's a full time job if I wanted to keep up with it. So I turn over that stuff to the experts. But you just have to realize that it's not a static platform anymore. Everything's changing all the time. The one thing that probably irks me the most is that they only give us these tiny little places where we can run our ads. It's like little classifieds everywhere. I'm like, yeah. I'm a long copy ad copywriter. Don't give me classifieds. That's an insult. But you need to know how to make those work because they've, those things have to get the click. And you then, you, you know, the story. Yeah. So I would say, find out where you want to be, what kind of market or industry or niche you want to focus on as a copywriter, what turns you on. You have to love what you're selling. I've been fortunate. I haven't had to work with clients I didn't like or I didn't approve of their products. I've been fortunate to be able to have high quality clients. But when you're starting out, you kind of have to do, you know, even spec work. So choose something you love. And then write the heck out of it because the number one thing you need are samples to get started. And the only way you're going to do that is by writing. The key to successful writing is just sitting down and writing. Does that help? Yeah, quite a bit. And, you know, and, and I think too, like well, some of the things that I've seen for people is I've seen, you know, like you brought up, there's sort of multiple ways that you can be a copy writer. I think when you come up like we did, we view it as like you write the long form sales stuff, but that's sort of, that is a job. And now there's so many more jobs, right? Um, yes, you exactly. know, there's, there's email. So I know a lot of people are really, you know, focusing on that side. Um, it's funny to me because I've always felt like email was, and this sounds bad, but for me, it was always like an afterthought. It was pretty easy. If you wrote the whole sales piece, I just take three or four of my best parts and kind of tweak it and here you know there's your emails yeah. um but I'm, I'm seeing now that there's people that just do that that's all they do they just sit there and write and they write emails and the return on that for the company can be can be massive right you know we've seen it i have a supplement company and we you know one email that does great we're like what a day we're cranking and then if it doesn't, it doesn't do good i'm like what's going on this is it broken you know like so you get that instant feedback. And I think a lot of people like that. I'm sure for you back, back in the day, especially when you were just getting started, probably stressful waiting for weeks to see what, what the results were, right? You had to wait oh, around. Man, absolutely. Um, you know, now yeah. you hit send and you wait 30 seconds and hit re refresh, you know? <laughs> that is so true. In fact, the, my client here in Visalia that I worked with for uh, ever since I was with Jay Abraham, they're my longest running client. Uh, they became aware of what you're talking about. They said, don't even look at the results for the first three or four days that it starts coming in because it'll just drive you crazy. Wait a little time, wait a week for the, everybody to tally up the orders and then you'll get an accurate picture without putting yourself through a lot of agony. But sometimes they'll, John Carlton wrote a lot of their best promos and they would break even on the second day of response. They got so many calls and mail responses that they were doing great. It was, it was, they're probably the biggest success story that I have as well as John. When you read John's material, you'll hear all about optimum training systems. And that's the client, the name uh, of the yeah. client that's here. You've heard of them? 
Yes. Well, let, let's talk about this some. I think let's try to get some tips out there. You know, when sure. it comes to writing copy, like you know, we all we all know that headlines are a real big, big thing. So, how do you approach those? You know, what's your strategy there? Do you write them first? Do you write them at the end? Do you write fifty of them? You know, I've I've heard every different uh, approach. What's your? I favor the writing multiple headline approach. You can't come up with it in your head and then perfect it in your head. I, I use nothing but um, legal pads for my, when I need to start getting my flow going, I just get out a pen, I sit somewhere comfortable and quiet and I get my pad and I just start writing one headline after another, after another. And that will usually get you the best result. If you use more of a template approach, I know that templates are kind of popular these days, you're limiting yourself. Templates aren't bad because they are based on successful models, but yeah. don't just think that you can fill in the blank with a headline. Sometimes you can and get away with it, but the best headlines are unique headlines and they just come to you sometimes. And that's why if you're writing them down, your eye is still wandering over the page and looking at the words and it'll make more connections. And often word choice is the most important part for the, your headlines because you do want an efficient headline. But the key to what the headline should produce as a result is what I call the huh, what reaction. Mm. If the headline makes you do that, like even a shocking headline on the news, say about, you know, an earthquake or a flood, some kind of disaster, the reaction is huh, what? In a better way when you're talking about something that's serving the customer or the reader, they'll be like, huh, what? In other words, tell me more. I want it. That's the result you have to produce with your headline. Not just cutesy, not clever, not just a blind headline, unless it's well done to where they're going, tell me more. Does that help? Yeah, a lot. What, what you. do you, yeah, I, I will say this too. Like I've seen a lot of times the really, really good headlines, you don't, you would never teach it. You know what I mean? It's not a teachable thing. Like, 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 you know, like, like when I teach them, I talk about, I, I have this system, I call it fire. And it's not to give you a template, but it's to kind of give you like a category. So like the F is fear. So anything that strikes that fear, you know, some scary thing, grab their attention. The I is inspire. That's like the benefit promise side of things. You know, the, the R is re relate which is like a, the story size where you can, you know, tell a story, share a testimonial type thing. And then the E is educate, which is like teaching lessons, uh, statistics. Um, but there, there's a, there's a different type, which isn't even any of those sort of, and that's like, for example, the famous, I think it was Gary Bits of Benga lies, lies, lies yes. piece, right? That's right. nothing. That's, nothing at all right but but yet it was powerful because it, it's almost i would almost call it maybe if i was gonna say something it's almost like a camouflage right it's like it's a, it's an ad but it doesn't feel like an ad and i think that is a big key to some of those runaway hits is that they don't come across as trying to sell you something they're more they're informative so they could maybe you could maybe couch them under the educate angle but but they're just different you know, and, and you know, they're not the who else wants to lose 10 pounds this week? You know, what I mean, right. like, exactly, you know, those are like the you, those are your two extremes, right? You have the lies, lies piece, which is like completely out there, doesn't promise anything, doesn't show anything. Maybe we know it does like stoke some um, anger, some frustration, but but uh, you know, and that's what, and like you've said, it's it's tough in a way to teach that, it's almost like a gut feel. That you develop and i have a quote that i came up with the other day which is um you know uh a good copywriter knows the rules a great one knows the prospect and and so i think that's where that comes from that time yeah. experience that's why no matter how good you are you're not going to be great until you really know who you're selling to because that's very true i tell people that all the time because i think people get so focused on the words you know Right. Did I say this right? Does this read right? And that's important. But that's like part two. You know, part one is the strategy and the thinking and who are you talking to and what are you trying to sell and why are you trying to sell it and what and why would they want it? And until you get that part right, 
a lot of it, you know, the copy almost is execution of the strategy side, right? That's yes, right. Um, and it's funny because you don't really see a lot of people teaching that side of it. I mean, every time you buy a course, it's always about grab a benefit, write the copy, use these kind of words, d discover, reveal, um, you know, and um, there's not a lot of teaching the strategy behind why we do those things. That's right. Very well said, Mike, because it is psychology. You know, all selling is psychology fundamentally. And then you just plug in the data. Uh, yeah. Gary Bensavania, who you mentioned, I would love to hear his story. I've never heard it of how he came up with lies, lies, lies. You know, if there was a, a funny story, that, that probably is. Because some of those best headlines just are quirks, like you're saying. And probably he, he may have even read it from somebody who wrote in, you know, getting your customer feedback. That's why one of the first things I do is read the remarks or comments on a website. And the frequently asked questions are a great way to get information. But like you said, when I'm interviewing a new client, all those questions that you were talking about, you know, get me into their mindset. You know, that's where you have to start and then connecting the product to their promise and the problem. Uh, and I'm since we're talking a lot about Gary Bensavenga, not that all great copywriters are named have to be named Gary. You know, it is just three of us, <laughs> <laughs> Albert Bensavenga and me. But his uh, famous one that he revealed just just to a handful of people back then was what he calls the persuasion equation. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah. Okay. And it, for the audience, it's problem plus promise plus proof plus proposition equals persuasion. It also satisfies your alliteration. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but if you just follow that, and that's even for you, that's your, a good headline formula, as well as the formula for the entire ad or promo. It's the five P's, problem plus promise plus proof plus proposition Sorry. equals persuasion. Sorry, can you say those again? Because I, I want to make sure everyone... Yeah, problem. You have to start with what the problem is. And then the promise... Okay, you've got a promise for the solution that you're going to, plus proof. That's the biggest element that Bensavenga is good on. When he had his one seminar that he charged $5,000 a person, the main thing he hammered home at that seminar was proof elements. Make sure you have the most powerful proof elements, and there are all kinds of proof elements, but that's what makes good copy great copy. It's not just how you say it, it's what you say, and then the proposition, a good offer, as we all know, offer is even more important than copy. But if you line all those up, you will have a persuasion, a persuaded person at the very end, and you'll get the response rates that you need. Obviously, no, there's no such thing as a 100% response rate. Some of these companies I work with, they're willing to pay 250 to $500 to buy a new customer, because they know they'll make that up on the back end. So giving yourself that kind of, that's a pretty fat uh, ma maximum allowable cost. Some of my other clients, their maximum allowable cost for marketing cost per order is maybe $5, not 500. <laughs> so yeah. the, you can see the dynamics. And that's the other thing about being a good copywriter is you do have to know marketing math and m numbers because you, you have to talk to the, co the client and they wanna know that you are intimately knowledgeable about the marketing strategy like you said it's not just copy it's strategy and the strategy everything comes down to numbers so i i carry a calculator with me everywhere now they're on the phone luckily but if you're not familiar with just how to make those numbers work you're lacking but if you are a copywriter who knows the numbers and can tell the client how to make those numbers work you're a much more value yeah and i tell people that all the time because because I, I get asked yeah which you probably do too, which is like, how do I get started or what do I do or how do I learn more? And, and I think for me, it's, it's what you said as well, getting that first job in that space was so important because when, you know, if you're hired, so there's a lot of people, maybe they get asked, hey, write a blog post, I'll pay you 40 bucks. You know, that's, that's really not the same type of thing that we're going on about, but, but the problem with those kind of jobs, even if it is write me five emails, you know, you're almost throwing your copy into a black hole, you know, and they're not calling you back going, oh, that crushed it, you know, so you don't know. 
So when yeah. I, when, when, if, if you can't work in an, in a company where you have a good manager and they're giving you that feedback or a good boss, you know, and they're coming to you and saying, Hey, this one, Hey, this one sucks. You know? And that was what I did. I mean, I know I wrote three or four versions of a sales page and every time I would go give it to my, uh, uh, boss there, and she'd be like, "This is terrible. Start over." Oh, <laughs> no, back again, you know. And and mm-hmm. I mean, I remember, and I'm not that kind of person, but I was. I remember being almost in tears because I hate doing things again and again and again. That's like against me. And I was on maybe the fifth or sixth version. This is early, early. I was like brand new, and I remember just having this sort of like make or break. Like, do I quit and say, "Screw this. It's way too hard." Or, and I went and I did it again. I didn't want, I mean, I was like to the breaking point. It was like probably 2 a.m. I was still up. I was in the office just typing away. I'm 24, you know, years old. And um, finally I gave it to her and she was kind of like, eh, this will do. You know, and I was like, huh, I can't believe it. You know, like I, I never thought, it felt like it would never end. And I think also being younger, you have a very small time view. So to me, that was the biggest thing I had ever done now. I, right. I'll write the same thing 10 times over. I don't care, you know, but, <laughs> but, but you got to grow with that, right? You grow over yes. time. And, and so, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, uh, that's a key that I, that I think people should, if they can, if they can get that chance, getting that feedback, tracking it. Cause yeah, you do need to be able to see did the email get open rates? Did it get uh, click through rates? Did it go to spam? Maybe I need to tweak the way I've said things. Did it, if they do go to the page, are they, are they, buying things. And then if you can, what, you know, you, you can, these days you can install tracking things on there and you can see how far they scroll, what they click on, how, you know, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And you can start to kind of gain insight from that. I mean, there's, it's pretty cool. Like on my Shopify store, I can actually watch and see how people do stuff. But I found out the other day, people were trying to buy something, but they couldn't add it to their cart. You know, like those are things that when you're focusing just on writing copy, you would think your copy failed you. In reality, mm-hmm. it's a tech thing. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people just don't think about that. So, you know, that's a, that's a great point that you had started with. Like the, the marketing math is so important. Yes. It really is. And I, I, I don't know if I've ever even seen anyone teach that. Come to think no, I haven't, I haven't either, believe it or not. The, uh, the, the client side, when you work with the client, and you help them analyze their results. And that's what I've always done is if they give me, you know, because we'll test five, 10 lists at a time in direct mail. And so they said, okay, here's a, they send me an Excel spreadsheet. And then I kind of have to do the math on that for them and walk them through it and show them which lists are the ones we want to focus on and remail and which lists are dogs. Because the list is the most important part or audience or market. And, you know, like we used to call it list offer copy. And those are the, the three things you have to keep in mind. Yeah. And then when it comes to choosing the list, there's another thing called uh, RFA or RFM, um, recency, frequency, and amount, meaning the amount of uh, money that was spent on the transaction. And that's why they made it today RFM, recency, frequency, and money. Yeah. Mike, could I ask you for a favor yeah can we pause because i had too much coffee this morning oh yeah go ahead yeah. <laughs> i'll be right back it's usually me in that spot so i'm, I'm glad it's you with me go ahead I'll, I'll talk real quick while we're still here i'll just kind of check on people go ahead um so guys if you're just joining us or whatever we're on with gary Walterscheid. and gary i you know i'll speak more to his uh, story he, he'll be right back obviously but he, um, you know, basically he has been a copy writer for 37 years and has an incredible backstory. And I, I, I'm kind of, when, when he comes back on, I think we're going to go on and, and sort of talk about, he has a book that he's, that he's uh, just gotten done that I, that I want to uh, speak to. It's pretty interesting. It has, um, it's got, you know, he's got a whole entire uh, storyline about how a very interesting story. I don't, I don't want to give, give it away, but he basically had his life saved by someone you wouldn't expect. I'll just, I'll just say that. Um, so uh, I'll recap a couple things here too that we spoke about. Um, number one, he recommends a book that I think is pretty cool. It's called, it's by, it's called Fundraising 
the letters. So that's one whole area that I've not heard a lot of copywriters talk about, but you can actually um, be, as you can actually write copy to help organizations raise funds, be it in politics or in like animal uh, type things, any kind of like civil rights thing, any of those things, um, there's, there's always a need to raise funds. And those are just like everything. When you write copy, if you, if you recall this, you're always trying to write to persuade people to go and, you know, take an action, right? So that's one great way to do that. So check that out. It's by a guy named Jerry Huntsinger. I have it written down there. So Jerry has, has got this book and that's actually the book that started, I believe, uh, Gary on his copywriting journey. So pretty cool stuff. And He's back. All right. Hey, how you doing, people? Uh, doing good. Thank you for the, the, the break. Yeah, no. That's fine. So, yeah, I was talking about, I, I figured we'd move a little bit into talking about your book. I I just said that. Um, I don't want to give it away. So I said, this <laughs> very interesting person helped save your life. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't know, however you want to take that away. I would love to hear more about, about the book. And Sure, absolutely. The background to that is... Uh, when I finally got married, I was 34 and married a beautiful young lady, but she decided she didn't want to be married too long. So she left me in less than two years into the marriage. And I fell into a bitty, pretty bad depression, started drinking heavily and found out that it's kind of fun drinking. I hadn't been a big drinker before that. I'd always been on the low carb diet because my client here produced a, a version of the Atkins diet that we were selling. So I would always use whatever the client just so I can experience it. You know, I even, I started playing golf because they produce golf videos. I started doing martial arts because they do martial arts videos, yeah. that kind of stuff. You know, I always like getting involved in the product that I'm promoting. Cool. But when I started going out and uh, met some other young ladies, I became a party animal and for about 10 years it was on and this town i live in visalia california it's right below fresno if you look it up on the map central california it's all farming land around here and the people are very nice because it's a small farming town type of atmosphere even though it's about 140,000 population they're even building a second in and out burger now so oh, wow. i know when they built the first one it was right after i moved here and I said, okay, I'll stay. <laughs> you can't go without in and out Burger if you're from LA. Yeah. And that's where I grew up was in Los Angeles, obviously. So one day my liver decided to give out on me because that's what happens if you drink too much. Yeah. And I was down for the count. I don't want to gross you out, but there's this thing called esophageal varices. And basically when their, their liver stops working, your heart is still trying to pump blood into the liver, but the liver kind of closed its doors. And that blood pressure comes up through your esophagus and there are veins in your esophagus that aren't designed to hold that much pressure and they burst. And then they go right, all that blood goes right into your stomach. And when you have blood in your stomach, you ought naturally vomit. So I was in that situation. I don't want to describe it too bad but it was it was pretty bad and i thought oh boy i better sleep this off well i would have slept it off all right however this girl i knew who i'd been partying with for the last 10 years well she, for a long period of time she kind of left us and went down to la and became a porn star but then she quit that industry and came back to visalia and i was helping her get a job and so forth and she was at her house, at her mom's house, at the other end of town. And all of a sudden, she said she got this overwhelming feeling of doom, that something was seriously wrong with Gary. In fact, she even says she heard a voice that said, you have to go check on him right now. So I think that was like my guardian angel, if you happen to believe in that, I do. Talking to her and telling her to go over to my house. And luckily, she knew where I'd lived because I had moved since the last time I'd seen her. And I had my side gate open, the back door open so the dog could get in and out of the kitchen. And she came in and she saw everything and she found me passed out in my bedroom on my floor 
just a, a total wreck moments, maybe an hour from death. So she called 911 and they came over and saved me. So the title of my story there is A Porn Star Saved My Life. And I would like to author it. I've written it as a little book. It's about, I think, 60 pages or more, maybe 30,000 words. And I'm thinking of publishing it, but I haven't got it into the proper shape for publishing it yet. But any of your viewers and listeners who would like a copy, you can email me. And my email address is waltersheidgary at gmail.com. Just use the spelling that you see on the screen here. Walter Scheid, Gary. I'll type it out as well. For okay, me. great. Thank you, Mike. E-I-D. E-I-D, yeah. Like Stein, but Germans can't do anything the easy way. Okay. So that is, it's a humorous story. I made it humorous in order to make light of the thing because I'm really lucky to be alive. This coming May, it'll be 10 years. So I, uh, I tried to memorialize it in a story. And in that document, I also produced the copy for an ad that I wrote looking for a girlfriend when I first moved up here to Visalia from LA. And that was in 95. And I knew nobody up here. And I found out that it's kind of a close knit town. Everybody grew up together at their local high schools and so forth. And if you come in as an outsider, it's kind of hard to break in. And I didn't know any other path except to do what Jay Abraham had always recommended I do because Gary Halbert did it. And another guy named Chase Ravel, who was the founder of Entrepreneur Magazine, he did this also. As you may know, Halbert wrote a full page ad looking for a girlfriend. If you've never seen it, it's worth, uh, it's worth reading. It's hilarious. So I wrote a half page ad for myself in ran it in our local newspaper here. And I got flooded with the responses. I was a dating machine for like six weeks straight, lunch and dinner. And I just had to narrow down the field. And I finally picked one girl and went out for about two years, but I realized we weren't totally right for marriage. And then I did another thing that Jay Abraham also did. I, I married the waitress at our, my favorite restaurant. <laughs> because <laughs> Jay's wife, Christy, he met her at this really cool restaurant right near his office down there in Redondo Beach area. So I'm still trying to follow in Jay's footsteps. I ran the ad, I married a waitress. Now I just got to get as rich and famous as he is. <laughs> you're, you're on the way. <laughs> I'm on the way. Well, and Jay's, Jay's quite a guy. He, he treated me well. Like for instance, he even co-signed the loan on my first car because I was driving this little jalopy when I first uh, worked for him. He goes, you need a better car. So he went, we went down to the dealership and got me a nice little Pontiac Grand Am. This is in 1984 uh, or 86, excuse me. That's pretty awesome. And old. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the guy co-signed the loan, you know, because he yeah. knew I, I worked my butt off for him. I was there till late at night, every night. I had no social life, but uh, I was dedicated to making sure J. Abraham was happy with me. Yeah, and I think that is, you know, right there is a great thing to kind of bring up again. The idea, like, and I think we've kind of forgotten nowadays, but there's a lot of sacrifice early on. And, you know, people don't really think about that or maybe they don't want to admit it. But, you know, same, I mean, I, I probably wasn't quite as extreme, but, you know, same thing. I think when you're early and you're younger, you got to use that to your, to your advantage, you know, and because at the same time, yes, you're getting paid and you're, you can earn, but, you the value so much beyond that you know because you're getting a skill and that's what I, I love i think if you can write copy you've got a lifelong skill yes that's whether so you can whether it makes you seven figures or not maybe not but at the very least you can get a pretty good job you can write stuff you can take care of yourself you can take care of your kids your family and, and that's you know that's a great thing to have and there's not a lot of people i do see it growing i see a lot more people being attracted to it you have the the aw AI to kind of introduce it to a brand new audience. Um, what what would you say, being that you came out of it from that way too, in a sense, not through AWAI, but just the, you were a traditional writer. What would you say was the biggest change for you? Like, what would you give someone's advice? So let's say there's someone that's like trying to write a screenplay right now and they're just finding out about this. Like what, what what's your advice on the differences from going from being a fiction to copy? Good question. It, it, it comes down to, do you like to sell? Because as we know, copywriting is really a sales job, not a writing job. Mm -hmm. 
And that's something that Gary Halbert stressed always is that this isn't about writing. This is about selling and you better know how to sell. And you have to know how to sell ethically. Of course, we don't want to scam people out of because the power of words can be used to harm people and we don't want to do that. So finding a breakthrough would probably depend on a, if you like to sell and then find out what you would want to sell, what you can really seek your teeth into and get excited about. There are certain markets, like even the, the, the biggest market is the financial newsletter market, like with Agora and so forth. And I just don't care for that particular topic. It's, it's, either over my head or it bores me to tears. I can't, I think it's both, but that's why I don't excel in that market. I've tried it. I've, I've written a few winning packages, but that was a long time ago, just in the direct mail world. And like I said, everything's changed significantly now, but it's not in a, a, a market that I even pursue anymore. So pursue something you love and just write the heck out of, you know, read all, get the rules down. But then, as you said, know your market, know your prospect. Yeah. That that the phrase that you use is also uh, you, you may have gotten it from a, a good lawyer knows the law, but a great lawyer knows the judge. Yeah, actually, exactly <laughs> where it came from. Yes, I thought so. I recognized it, and I said, "Yeah, that works. That works for yeah, coffee as well." Yeah, it's so funny because I, I had someone tell me that, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, kind of like coffee, but I came up with it. I'll speak to one quick thing just for me personally. That, I, that, that I've gone through, and this is on the ethical side of things. Um, you know, I, it's not a, it's not big time out there, but it's, but it's out there. It's that, you know, I, I went through personally a lawsuit with, with the Federal Trade Commission. Oh, wow. And that was a nightmare of an experience. It was for a company that I didn't even own. It was a third party company that we were, uh, we were, selling on their again we were an affiliate of them um but unfortunately we were we got dragged in to help the case by by the end of it everyone that was there to help got dragged in so it was one of those kind of two or three and it, and it was like a two-year train wreck you know one of those oh, wow. every day and you're on calls with attorneys and everything's good and the next day it's really terrible and it's, uh, and it's fine again you know up and down up and down but but you know i really came out of that and i learned a lot you know and i and i I think, you know, the biggest thing, my, my biggest takeaway, and I'm just getting more, more and more, this is why I started this whole little side project, because I want to help people be careful with what you do and what you say. I didn't even write the ads. You know, I was more the owner behind the scenes, but okay. knowing what I know now, I, I, I see so much more about how we have to be more responsible and more careful about who we're selling to. I think that's the big thing is that there's a lot of people that are probably not a good fit for the product, but we're in this, you know, very stat focused, right? You're not thinking this is like a grandma, you're thinking this is someone I'm just gonna sell, you know, like it's a, you know, so I think that was a big thing for me to, to take a step back and say, okay, cause I think when you come up in the copywriting industry, it's all about conversion rate, conversion rate, conversion rate. And so that's part of what I'm pushing back on and what I'm trying to teach is it's not about getting the best conversions it's about getting the right customers. Right. And, and, you know, and, and I get it, it's tough. And it's one of those weird areas where there's this kind of like you have re, 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 uh, reality meets ethics, meets marketing, meets cost, meets all these things. Like I talk about a gym, you know, your average gym, if they were, if they wanted to be completely above board, they could say, well, you know, it's 30 bucks per month, but, only pay a dollar per time you come in. That's how we bill you, you know? Well, maybe that would be like the ultimate best for the consumer probably because they're only gonna pay when they go. But we also know the gym would probably go under and there'd be no gym for anyone, right? So so there's like all this weird stuff, you know? But I but I do think like a big key is where, where we're driven from the copy per perspective is, you know, we're always trying to make, you know, how can it be, how's, what makes this easy, right? We, we're, we're driven to make it sound super easy because no one's going to be like, this is this super hard thing. You're probably going to struggle, but check it out. You know, like, so there's that, that's, that's, that's the area that I'm traversing into and trying to help fix because I've been through, I've been bit by it. Um, 
sadly that puts me in good company in our space because <laughs> it's say it but you know unfortunately been a lot of people and i i never would have thought of myself in a bad way i never set out to do anything negative or bad but it, you know I, I think that's where that's where a lot of us you know um have to learn you know and um you know so i my joke is i it was a suit for a company I didn't own, selling a product I didn't create with ads I didn't write. <laughs> but <laughs> true, it was all true. But you know, but I get it. At the end of the day, you're responsible when you're behind the scene, and you're the you know, that's just who, the way it is. And uh, we didn't have to admit to anything, which was good. We were able to settle it. Um, but you know, it was still it was just a painful time, very expensive. If you've ever paid an attorney. I mean, three of them at, for one call and you're thinking just, you know, seeing it go. Um, but yeah, I think that's a big thing. And, and, uh, and I still don't know yet, Gary, how to like, I haven't been able to figure out how to properly articulate it, you know, because there's, there's a lot there. I'm sure you've been around and so you know what I'm saying here. There's, there's that pressure to sell, but then there's a the pressure to not sell and, and how do you balance it and make sure you're ethical in what you're trying to do. So just thought I would throw that. It, that's a well-told story and you're exactly right because there are the economic realities of you got to stay afloat yes. and what, really what it comes down to is the slower and more honestly you grow the more solid your growth will be and so long term you won't have a problem it's the get rich quick fast buck people who are the damage they do the damage yeah. And they've, they've even damaged the copywriting industry, if I can be frank, yeah. that they promise too much. They promise the people that, hey, if you just take my course, you'll be making uh, $600,000 a year by next month. And it's like, no, no. Yeah, that's, the whole, that's the whole thing. And it's, it's funny because it, it, it actually perfectly ties in to the, um, to the whole Eugene Schwartz um, five uh, stages thing, right? Like, the whole idea of being stage one, you, you just say, hey, I've got this thing. And then stage two is, hey, I've got this thing and it's even faster, right? And then the stage three, I got this thing that's even faster because it has this unique thing, right? So we end up amplifying, amplifying, amplifying. So it's like, it's, uh, it's like almost like a, like a whirlpool of promises. And if you're gonna jump out and stand out, the promises escalate and escalate and they escalate until either the industry dies, the government steps in, or, you know, people kind of reset again. And I think what it comes down to is what happens is you get the, the audience becomes so skeptical. So it's weird because it, it all works against it, right? The audience mm -hmm. is becoming more skeptical. So then the, you, you're trying to amplify those claims and balance out their skepticism. And then that is just going, going, going. And then you have competitors who have zero ethics coming in with crazy stuff. Now you wouldn't even feel com comfortable to ever run, but you're getting compared to that, right? And yeah. then you, well, how do I make mine sound a little better? And then everyone's trying to sound a little better. And so it's like, that's the dark side, I think of the industry as a whole and, and uh, one that I'm trying to help in some way, shape or form, but it's, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm probably not the guy to figure it out per se, but I'm trying to at least help talk about that. You know, that's one of my, I feel like I went through something pretty, painful but i think there's a you know i always try, try to find the good in, in everything yes exactly and 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 it's honorable for you to do that because most people would rather just to go for the fast buck yeah if, if you had to put your money on it it's like oh yeah the fast buck people are the more motivated they're the hype oriented they're the type a personality guys who really you know it's, it's all about them and they'll, they'll let the chips fall where they may but I've been around long enough that I've heard the horror stories like you told is that it's not worth it. In fact, yeah. one of the, uh, it was kind of a scam kind of direct mail promotion in the justice department world, they call it a pump and dump operation yeah. where you pump up the stock uh, artificially. And they, these guys learned how to do that with direct mail promotions. So they would buy the stock real low right before the mailing hit. And then they would track the mailing and see the response. And the, every, all these people who got the mailing were going out and buying that stock. So the price was bid up because it was a usually penny uh, small yeah. cap stocks. And so they would go, okay, now we sell. And so they would buy low. and But it was engineered by them. 
and they would sell high to all these suckers who got their direct mail piece that was promoting the stock. And they have a nice little word for that. They call it investor relations. And a buddy of mine who told me, yeah, I can get you some of those jobs. They pay 40 grand, but you have to spend well, maybe 50 grand, but you have to spend about, if it was 50, I think he told me 50, but you have to spend 40 of that on lawyers. So you're really only pocketing 10, and, which is what you get without all the stress anyways. I'm like, yeah, I'll pass. <laughs> no, it's funny because I'm, I'm not a, um, I'm not a deep, a deep diner type, um, but I've got a, um, I'm draw, I'm, I'm trying to draw this thing where I, I draw like you know, like it's like a pie, like a graph, and I show like if you just run a straight direct response company, it's gonna be like, you know, but if mm -hmm. you draw like a brand. It's going to be more like slow and then uptake, 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 uptake. And so that's been, you know, the big shifts for, for me is I use direct response principles, but I apply them to brands. And it's tougher in a way because you don't, because you're, you're, you know, you either have to raise capital or have some because you're not going to make the sales right away. And, you right. know, whenever I, I have a course where I teach um, copywriting research, and even on that, like I know the copywriter in me knows I could sell way more, way harder, but I don't pursue that anymore. I just say, look, if you have time on your hands, here's the free strategy. If you do, if you have some extra cash, I've done all that for you. Here's that, you know? Um, and I know that's not the strongest close, right? I could say, oh, if you're ready, if you're serious, if this is what you want, you're gonna find a way, you're gonna make it happen. And, uh, you know, but I, I, I just don't because I, I, I feel like, you know, and that's always been me anyway. I'm, I'm not like a in your face sales guy. I think you can, you can mm -hmm. probably tell that I'm, I'm not like a right. you know, closer type. Um, so same here, same here. Yeah. So I think, you know, and I, that, that's probably also partially what attracts us to copy, right? As well, is maybe mm -hmm. we have that sales side, but we don't have that, you know, door to door, I'm gonna go make it happen every day side. Um, right. But yeah, this has been a great chat. So I don't wanna keep you for too long. I, I wanna say anything you wanna say here at the end, kind of wrap it up, give us some inspirational thoughts, you know? Well, I had one prop that I wanted to show everybody. All right. I, put them? I am honored to actually have, you've heard of the boron letters from Gary Halbert? Oh, I got yes. it. Yeah. Well, these are a handwritten set that Halbert gave me personally. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. Oh, or not. man, that's amazing. Yeah. So there's two volumes and I found them as I was cleaning out my storage unit the other day. And these must be, this, this, Halbert was one of a kind. I'm so sad when he passed away, but he left a legacy. Yes. And if there's one guy you can learn from more than any of the other gurus out there, it's Gary Halbert. And he was also very funny. He was so entertaining. He would crack everybody up. He loved that more. It was really just the, the Gary Halbert comedy show. Yeah. And, copywriting was the excuse for it and I kind of do the same thing and I'm a I'm a singer and a, uh, I, I do public speaking and that's one of the things I would like to probably recommend is if you've ever heard of this group called Toastmasters yeah. it's worldwide yeah. I think you said you were in a uh, or no it was another person I was talking to but yeah. find a local club they're all online and in fact you can even join the club that I'm in, ViceliaToastmasters.org. And Visalia is V as in Victor, I, S as in Sam, A, L, I, A. And then Toastmasters, one word. But Toastmasters will actually help you become a better copywriter. It's helped me in the, I've been involved in it for about 10 years now. Because one of the key things to perfecting your copy is to read it out loud. Yes. And that's what you do when you prepare a Toastmaster speech. The speeches go from five to seven minutes, typically. So they're not a lot of words, maybe a thousand words. And so that's usually the length of a, a decent short ad. Long copy ads can go into the 5,000 words or more. But if you learn how to do that and you practice through Toastmasters, it's like taking your own little private course on how to become a better writer because it helps you you learn by doing. Yeah. So that's another uh, tip that I would recommend to people is check out Toastmasters and you can go on their main site, toastmasters.org. 
I mean, it's a nonprofit, doesn't cost much, and it will really benefit you even in copywriting. That's awesome. Great advice. Well, Gary, I want to say thank you again. I'm going to- My pleasure, Mike. I'll, I'll send out the replay and I'll, I'll, okay. I'll put your email in there too so people can email you. Great. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I'm happy to send that document out. You'll get a kick out of it. Good comments too. So this has been great. Gary, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mike. Have a fantastic day. You too, Bye. Chuck. Bye-bye, guys. Bye -bye.